the nine black wagons of the midnight carnival seem smaller by daylight and not menacing at all but flimsy and fragile as dead leaves their draperies were gone and they were now adorned with sad black banners cut from blankets and stubby black ribbons that twitched in the breeze they were arranged strangely in a scrubby field a pentacle of cages enclosing a triangle and mommy fortuna's wagon lumping in the center this cage alone retained its black veil concealing whatever it contained Mommy Fortuna was nowhere to be seen. The man named Rook was leading a straggling crowd of country folk slowly from one cage to the next, commenting somberly on the beasts within. This here's the manticore. Man's head, lion's body, tail of a scorpion. Captured at midnight, eating werewolves to sweeten its breath. Creatures of night, brought to light. Here's a dragon. Breathes fire now and then, usually at people who poke it, little boy. Its inside is an inferno, but its skin is so cold it burns. The dragon speaks seventeen languages badly, and it's subject to gout. The satyr. Ladies keep back. A real troublemaker. Captured under curious circumstances, revealed to gentlemen only for a token fee after the show. Creatures of night. Standing by the unicorn's cage, which was one of the inner three, the tall magician watched the procession proceed around the pentacle. I shouldn't be here, he said to the unicorn. The old woman warned me to stay away from you. He chuckled pleasantly. She has mocked me from the day I joined her, but I have made her nervous all that time. The unicorn hardly heard him. She turned and turned in her prison, her body, her body shrinking from the touch of the iron bars all around her. No creature of man's night loves cold iron, and while the unicorn could endure its presence, the murderous smell of it seemed to turn her bones to sand and her blood to rain. The bars of her cage must have some sort of spell on them, for they never stopped whispering evilly to one another in clawed, pattering voices. The heavy lock giggled and whined like a mad monkey. "'Tell me what you see,' said the magician, as Mommy Fortuna had said it to him. "'Look at your fellow legends, and tell me what you see.' Rook's iron voice came clanging through the wan afternoon. Gatekeeper of the underworld, three heads and a healthy coat of vipers, as you can see, last seen above ground in the time of Hercules, who dragged him up under one arm, but we lured him to light again with the promises of a better life. Cerberus, look at those six cheated red eyes. You may look into them again one day. This way to the Midgard serpent, this way. The unicorn stared through the bars at the animal in the cage. Her eyes were wide with disbelief. It's only a dog, she whispered. It's a hungry, unhappy dog, with only one head and hardly any coat at all. The poor thing. How could they ever take it for Cerberus? Are they all blind? Look again, the magician said. And the satyr, the unicorn continued. The satyr is an ape, an old ape with a twisted foot. The dragon is a crocodile, much more likely to breathe fish than fire, and the great manticore is a lion, a perfectly good lion, but no more monstrous than the others. I don't understand. It's got the whole world in its coils, Rook was droning, and once though more, the magician said, look again. Then, as though her eyes were getting used to darkness, the unicorn began to perceive a second figure in each cage. They loomed hugely over the, over the captives of the midnight carnival, and yet they were joined to them. Stormy dreams sprung from a grain of truth. So there was a manticore, famine-eyed, slobbering-mouthed, roaring, curving his deadly tail over his back until the poisoned spine lolled and nodded just above his ear. And there was a lion, too, tiny and absurd by comparison. Yet they were the same creature. The unicorn stamped in wonder. It was so in all the other cages. The shadow dragon opened his mouth and hissed harmless fire to make the gapers gasp and cringe, while Hell's snake-furred watchdog howled triple dooms and devastation down on its betrayers, and the satyr limped leering to the bars and beckoned young girls to impossible delights, right there in public. As for the crocodile, the ape, and the sad dog, they faded steadily before the marvelous phantoms, until they were only shadows themselves, even to the unicorn's undeceived eyes. This is a strange sorcery, she said softly. There's more meaning than magic in this. The magician laughed with pleasure and great relief. Well said, well said indeed. I knew the old horror wouldn't dazzle you with her two-penny spells. 
His voice grew hard and secret. She's made her third mistake now, he said, and that's at least too many for a tired old trickster like herself. The time draws near. The time draws near, Rook was telling the crowd, as though he overheard the magician. Ragnarok. On that day when the gods fall, the serpent of Midgard will spit a storm of venom at great Thor himself till he tumbles over like a poison fly, and so he waits for judgment day, and dreams about the part he'll play. It may be so, I couldn't say. Creatures of night, brought to light. The cage was filled with a snake. There was no head to it, and no tail, nothing but a wave of tarnished darkness, rolling from one end of the cage to the other, leaving no room for anything but its own thunderous breathing. Only the unicorn saw, coiled in the corner, a baleful boha, brooding, perhaps, over its own judgment on the midnight carnival. But it was tiny and dim as the ghost of a worm in the serpent's shadow. A wandering gawk stuck up his hand and demanded of Rook, "'If this big snake do be coiled around the world, as you say, "'how come you be having a piece of it in your wagon? "'And if it can shatter the sea just by stretching of itself, "'what's to keep it from crawling off, "'wearing your whole show like a necklace?' "'There were murmurs of agreement, "'and some of the murmurers began to back warily away. "'I'm glad you asked me that, friend,' Rook said with a scowl. "'It just so happens that the Midgard Serpent exists in, like, another space from ours, "'another dimension.' Normally, therefore, he's invisible, but dragged into our world, as Thor hooked him once, he shows clear as lightning, which also visits us from somewhere else, where it might look quite different. And naturally, he might turn nasty if he knew that a bit of his tummy slack was on view daily and Sundays in Mommy Fortuna's Midnight Carnival, but he don't know. He's got other things to think of than that, than what becomes his belly button, and we take our chances." as do you all, on his continued tranquillity. He rolled and stretched the last word like dough, and his hearers laughed carefully. Spells of seeming, the unicorn said. She cannot make things. Nor truly change them, added the magician. Her shabby skill lies in disguise, and even that knack would be beyond her if it weren't for the eagerness of those gulls, those marks, to believe whatever comes easiest. She can't turn cream into butter, but she can give a line the semblance of a manticore, she, eyes that want to see a manticore there, eyes that would take a real manticore for a lion, a dragon for a lizard, and the Midgard serpent for an earthquake, and a unicorn for a white mare. The unicorn halted in her slow, desperate round of the cage, realizing for the first time that the magician understood her speech. He smiled, and she saw that his face was frighteningly young for a grown man, untraveled by time, unvisited by grief or wisdom. I know you, he said.